Hey, thanks for watching Make Me Smart on YouTube. To make sure that you never miss an episode, I know you don't want that to happen, hit subscribe right there down below. Oh, hello everyone. I'm Molly Wood. Welcome to Make Me Smart, our podcast about tech, the economy, and culture, where none of us is as smart as all of us. I know what you're thinking right now, isn't this the part where Kai Rizdal should be talking? That's a fair question. Uh, he is actually out today. And so I know you were all looking forward to the explainathon, and you sent in so many amazing questions, and thank you for that. We're going to do that later because Kai's not here. Uh, and between you and me, I think if I answered all of your questions without him, he would get a little jealous and have a lot of corrections on the inside. And so we didn't want to do that to him. So. We're going to do something completely different. Today's show, I'm actually very excited about this, is about fashion and climate change. Now, I know you have another question, which is, do those two things go together? And yes, it turns out that what we are wearing is just about as essential to solving the climate crisis as what we drive or how we eat or lots of other things uh, related to our economy. So to explain the connection between clothes and climate change. We have invited author and journalist Dana Thomas. She has written about fashion for the Washington Post and the New York Times, and she has a new book called Fashionopolis, The Price of Fast Fashion and the Future of Clothes. Dana, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Okay, so we're going to start with sort of the basic question. What, how big of an impact does fashion, and specifically fast fashion, have on the health of the planet? It's enormous. It's so much more than you ever would imagine. It was more than I imagine, and I've been covering the industry for 35 years. Yeah. The average garment today is worn seven times before it's tossed in the bin. And I'm told in, in China it's three times. That means that and 99% are not recycled. Only 1% is recycled. And most of it doesn't even break down because it's made of polyester. And polyester is effectively plastic, so it's not biodegradable. So that means our landfills are just heaving, heaving, heaving with clothes. We buy six times more clothes than we did two decades ago because the prices are artificially cheap. And we're just collecting and burning through them at a pace that's unsustainable. How does it compare in terms of scope to our driving habits or our eating habits or our energy usage? I think it's, you know, sort of the same. We It's all about convenience in the end. You know, it's easier now to go out and buy a cheap shirt when your buttons come off than to go and replace the shirt. Or because you spilled something on it, you just toss it. Or, you know, got a little, you know, faded a bit, you just toss it because it only costs 10 15 or 20 bucks. What was surprising mm -hmm. when I was working on the book was I kept hearing that our clothes have never been so cheap. And I was like, what does this mean? And then I found an article talking about the cost of fashion in the 1930s, and it was exactly the same price, not adjusted for inflation, but the same price. And I thought, wow. how can we be paying the same amount we were paying during the Depression, the worst economic era of our, you know, in the modern times? And we're earning so much more money, you know, relatively. So it shows that now we buy 10 instead of buying one, and we buy by the sack full, and we burn through it, you know, seven times, and, and off it goes. I'm so shocked by other, that stat, seven to three times. Yeah. There are other, econo there are other uh, environmental impacts that are, that are mm -hmm. surprising. Um, jeans. Did you know that at any given moment of the day, half the planet is wearing jeans? Right. And 99% of those jeans are dyed with synthetic indigo, which is all sorts of toxic chemicals and uses gobs and gobs of water, like gallons, millions of gallons, to wash them to make them soft enough, what's called finishing, for us to wear. And all that synthetic indigo gets, some of it goes into treatment plants, but a lot of it just gets dumped straight into rivers and turns the rivers opaque and kills all the life in them. I saw a dead river next to a former denim factory in Ho Chi Minh City, and it was so vile it made me feel sick to my stomach. And it was really sad. Wow. Then there's the yeah, whole I mean, cotton according... question. You know, Wait, cotton. there's a cotton question? I thought there's cotton There's the cotton was question. Fine. <laughs> Organic <laughs> cotton is wonderful. But the, but uh, conventional cotton, for one kilo of conventional cotton, it requires one kilo of chemicals. It's one to one. Hmm. 
Wow. There's the, you know, the defoliation chemicals. There's the chemicals to make it grow faster. There's the chemicals to keep away, you know, pesticides and herbicides. There's, you know, Roundup. And the seeds are called Roundup Ready because they're primed with Roundup. And then they're all GMOs. 99% of our cotton is GMO. And, you know, there are a lot of people who are pro-GMO. I live in Europe where we still go, hmm, we're not so sure about those GMO stuff. It sounds like you're describing a bunch of trends that, that got us here. That there are oh, yeah. many more chemicals and much more processing. You know, yeah. so it sounds like we're talking about food. Speaking of GMOs, and genetic um, engineering, right? Exactly, and also these kind of fast fashion trends that have made things cheaper, more accessible, and globalization. And involve, right. Talk to me about that. The the sort of fast fashion trends that made it all so much easier and cheaper, and also include a lot of sort of worse materials, right? Yes. Well, cheap materials. And cheap materials cheap are materials. the worst materials. You know, the book that I wrote was inspired by Fast Food Nation when I wrote, read that book. And I heard, you know, we all knew that fast food wasn't good for us. You didn't have to be a rocket scientist to figure that out. But when I read about the impact on our schools and I read about the impact on, you know, the lower classes with employment, and then I, I skipped the meat chapter because I knew it would be just too gross and I would never – I would be an instant vegetarian – but, mm -hmm. you know, when I read that there was hardly any potatoes in the French fries because it was all about chemicals and flavorings and and the color, all the different dyes to make your bun that exact color, I was like, wow, I had no idea. Well, that's what I discovered working on this book about the fashion industry. And the fashion, the fast fashion part of it is relatively young. It's only 25, 30 years old. And curiously, it kind of grew out of a movement a, a, an invention, a, a business system that was created by the U.S. apparel industry to fight off imports, cheap imports. And it was called QR, Quick Response. And it was come, it came together with a consulting company. And it was the idea that you make a small amount and you put it on the shop floor. And then if it sells, then you put the rest in production, that you don't just plan a year and a half in advance, roll out the clothes, put them on the store floor, then you wait to see if they sell, and then they're marked down, marked down, marked down, eventually tossed and burned. That you would respond to the consumer pace and purchasing purchasing on the retail floor and keep it, you know, do quick drops, as they call them, putting it on the floor, dropping it on the floor. And they were just doing it with their regular collection. But then mm -hmm. Mr. Ortega, the owner of Zara, saw this and said, hmm, I can apply this to my trendy little fashion company that I have here in Spain called Zara and start doing drops, but each time differently. So he started changing up the outfits on the floor regularly. And hmm. the number of visits, it, draw, it drew consumers, it drew customers into the store more often because they're like, oh my gosh, what did they put in this week? And the, at the time he was doing this, the, av the average time, the number of times that a consumer went to a store, a customer was four to five times a year. And with Zara adapting, you know, adding the fashion component to the QR system, it mm -hmm. jumped up to 17 times a year. And mm -hmm. so you went 17 times a year, you bought 17 things instead of five, four or five things, or maybe you bought two things each time, you're buying 20, 26, 27, 28 things a year instead of eight or 10 and our consumption right. habits zoomed through the roof. At the same time, fashion went global. And this was be in large part because of NAFTA in the United States and similar trade agreements in Europe and the rising cost of, of um, manufacturing in these countries and the super low cost in, in offshore destinations, Mexico, Latin America, Southeast Asia, and now Africa. And... When I say low cost, it's it's really, really, really low cost. Mm -hmm. the The rule of thumb is if you paid twenty for it, the person who sewed it was paid twenty cents, twenty dollars, twenty cents. Wow! They don't earn a living wage. I went to Bangladesh for the book. Yeah. And when I was there, they were earning sixty eight dollars a month, which was half of what a living wage is. And a living wage is what economists calculate is what you need to pay. To, to house, feed, and, ho and um, take care of your family, clothe your family. So they basically need two full-time jobs to do this, just to do the basics, just the very basics. 
That's how little they're paid. And it's like right. that all along the supply chain because there is no oversight. There is no safety and in health inspections. There are no rules and labor laws like we have in the United States or in the UK or in France, 35-hour, 37- or 40-hour work weeks, paid vacation, health benefits, none of that. So they pay mm -hmm. them pennies to make these clothes. They don't have any other things built into the price. And they do that all along the supply chain to the farmers, to the suppliers, to the tech, to the weavers, to the dyers, all these people offshore, so that the cost of the garments is nothing. And then you know, when I they're wonder, charging you yeah. $20 for it, they're making enough money to become some of the richest people in the world, billionaires. Wow. Wow. I wonder, some of this is sort of like things that we had inklings of. When yes. you went and I researched all of this, of and right, of course, did, did you find it a little heartbreaking that this is that this industry that I had you know, no you've idea covered for so like long this. you love? Yeah, is it? Yeah. It's so yeah. much worse than you thought. Oh, so much worse than I thought. And for me, you know, this book is about fashion, but yet it's not. It's about society today. It's about our e economy today. It's about globalization and the backlash to globalization. Mm -hmm. I'm here in London, and the Extinction Rebellion kids are out in the streets cause, right, causing havoc, you know, protesting, saying we need to really change our ways or the earth is going down. And, you know, it's all, it's all the peace. And it's, I use mm -hmm. fashion to talk about much bigger picture because we understand it. We all get dressed in the morning. You don't need an engineering degree to understand what I'm talking about or an economics degree. But for me, you know, to, we talk about wealth and, and you know, disparity, econo e um, our economy inequality, economic inequality. And the perfect example of this is that the owner of Zara, when I was working on the book, was the second richest man in the world worth $68 billion dollars. And the people in Bangladesh making clothes for companies like H&M and Zara were being paid $68 a month. And mm. I thought right there, there it is. That's, the, that's exactly what's happening everywhere with everything. Right. So on the one hand, uh, this makes My husband me calls to... the book a little bit Marxist. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> you know, that can happen uh, the more but, you, you know, dig maybe into these it's time topics. For a dash of Marxism. You know, maybe, well, you I know think... maybe we've had some unbridled capitalism for too long and we need a little dash of Marxism just to level it out a bit. This is a, a conversation we have been having on the show is, is whether capitalism works for everyone and, and clearly it does not. Uh, but I wonder at what point do I need to take a walk through my closet versus trying to make systemic change. I think this is the question we're all wrestling with, but this, because you said, is so personal that I, I'm looking at my Lululemon yoga pants and my Uggs and I'm sorry to admit right. my like Gap sweater. And I'm thinking, okay, how about, how bad is this? How bad well, am I? You know, <laughs> there's certain things. Well, my, I have some Gap that got buried in a closet, you know, in the bottom of a drawer and my daughter's now wearing it. It's 25 years old. So that shows that there was gap, good Gap at one point that has staying power if it's trendy. Well, they say the 90s are back, so I guess, you know, she's wearing original 90s. Um, it's, <laughs> I think what I, wanted to, what I want to do with this book and is that I think we can, we, can ha we can cause systemic change by looking at our closet, that we can do it person by person. It's a bit like the organic food movement. You know, when Fast Food Nation came out, fast food didn't go away. But what did happen was that there was a rise of organic food and farm-to-table and small farms in response to give us options and choice. And that's what I'm hoping will happen. I, I profile a really wonderful woman from Tennessee named Sarah Bellows, who's a natural indigo farmer. She's really the only natural indigo farmer who's doing it on an industrial scale, meaning that you can buy blue jeans Dot from a major company. I think they're at Patagonia now um, and a couple other places made with her natural indigo. When I talked to her in 2016, she said, I really hope I can get 1% of the market. If I can get 1% of the market, natural indigo, we've achieved something. Mm -hmm. She, I checked in with her two years later. She had, she said, it looks like we might actually meet, get to 3%. And I thought, good on you, girl. And if she can yeah. get to 3%, maybe she'll inspire other folks to get into it, and it'll become 10 or 20%. And if we're buying organic cotton jeans made with natural indigo, then when they're, we're done with them, when they're completely falling apart, we can put them in our compost and then put them in our garden. 
or we can put wow. them in somebody's compost, the city compost, because now cities are, we're about to have compost in Paris. And I know San Francisco has that. But we mm -hmm. can do that. And that's the difference. If we can just wean ourselves off of polyester, yes, polyester is cheap. But the point, you know, some of these companies sell us clothes that are made of polyester. And then they say you have to dry clean it. And the dry cleaning bill is more than what you originally paid for the garment because mm -hmm. it's so cheap. And then you go like, I'm not going to spend 20 bucks to dry clean a shirt that I only paid $9.99 for. And you toss it. And that's what we have to get away from. It's, you know, I want... I want people to start thinking about their clothes as an investment again and loving them and keeping them and wearing them. Like, I love Kate Middleton and Meghan Markle doing the royal rewear. you know? They're right. trotting out the same clothes over and over again. It made page six this week that Kate Middleton wore a blue McQueen coat for the fourth time. It was news. I thought, this is the kind of news we need. It's, it's good okay news, to right? rewear your clothes. It's good news. Well, I wonder how, you know, the opposite pressure seems to exist with... Well, actually, I wonder, you know, as you see, for example, there's all this pressure uh, among influencers to not wear the same thing twice. And that is that has led to this idea of rental clothes and rental subscriptions. Right. And simultaneously, you have a really strong retail trend around uh, buying used clothes. In fact, despite what I said, I'm wearing, yes. I'm on this new kick where I will not buy anything new if I can avoid it. And I'm all thread up all the time. And I wonder, you know, yeah. do you see hope there with a subscription service or the Absolutely. idea that I don't need to own 70 shirts? Absolutely. I've actually seen some numbers that say that our secondhand clothes, the the, the portion of our wardrobe de devoted to secondhand clothes will double from about 6 percent to 12 or 13 percent in a very short time, a couple of years, that mm -hmm. it's definitely becoming more of a trend. And when I cleaned out my closet most recently, um, because once I wrote this book, I'm like, right, we got to rethink our wardrobe because oh. this is just not <laughs> <laughs> we got to get more organic here. And I put what I had on the real real and it all sold. So it, it's, right. you know, pre-loved as a friend of mine in the business calls it, pre-loved clothes. And so they've gone on to have a second life. I really do try to think more about a circular way of, of consuming everything that, you know, that we have paper cups or, you know, glassware and not nothing that's disposable. And if it is disposable, it can go in the compost, you know, things that are, that has a second life or third life or continual life. So I do think rental, I've been renting too. I had to go to the Cannes Film Festival for work and I rented my gown, which was great because I mm -hmm. rented something far more extravagant than I would have ever purchased because I would have said, what am I going to do with an extravagant gown for $3,000? But to right. rent it for 250 sure, why not? And it was fun. And I rent mm -hmm. when I have to go um, to conferences and things like that where I have to be all dolled up and not in my writing garb of an organic t-shirt and an old pair of jeans. So, you know, it's, it's um, it's changing up really fast in a good way, and I and I yeah. think that that will keep that will that trend will keep going, and I think you know the fast fashion brands are going to have to rethink their model. Volume is not going to be the future, and it's not sustainable in any in a, any way. I really hope the idea of the economies of scale, which I've never quite understood, that you make a hundred and you sell eighty and you throw away twenty and you're making and it's profitable somewhere along the way, someone's losing money. Um, yeah. will go away because it's do just you think not, be... it's not efficient. Right. So how serious do you think the industry is getting? Your book came out in September just before Paris Fashion Week. There was talk this year uh, among designers and industry people about sustainability. Absolutely. But as you point out, it's interesting. you know, this, the Zara guy is the second richest person in the world. So how, how real is this and how much does it depend on consumer pushback? Um, I think it's much more real very quickly. It's a bit like the plastic straw phenomenon. You know, they went away mm. in what, 18 months? Plastic straw's gone. And now if you see yeah. one anywhere, you just tell, you know, what is wrong with you people, right? You hiss at them. <laughs> you don't, and you don't seem like some weirdo. It's like, no, you're the weirdos for still doing this. Um, I think I, I was talking to some an editor from British Vogue, and she said we'd all been reading your book before we got to Paris or Milan Fashion Week. And there we were sitting in the front row going, what are we doing here? And these clothes seem so inconsequential compared to this big picture that we've been thinking about and reading about, and that these are all one-off things, the, the show collection, and they may not go into production, but they're pushing trends, and they're influ you know, they'll be on influencers, and that's promoting wearing things. And she said, she was basically saying, we're having an existential crisis. Very quietly, we're having an existential crisis, because mm. you're, you've made us question how we're approaching all this and what 
on what we should be promoting and talking about versus what we've been doing forever, that the status quo may actually not be the right way to go right now. Maybe we need to change the message or the change our approach or change our point of view. Yeah. And I th said, and, cool, that's what I wanted to do. If that much has happened, we're on the right track. Epiphany, epiphany. Well, uh, before I let you go, I do want to geek out a little bit because you also talk in the book yeah. about how technology can help solve this problem. And oh, yeah. I would like to hear about innovative and fashion technology, tech such as mushroom leather. Yes, exactly. Tell me more. <laughs> well, one of my favorite companies is in is in Silicon Valley called Bolt Threads. And they grow silk in baths of yeast and spin it using the same system that spiders use. It's called spider silk. But it's grown out of DNA. It's all it's all made in a lab. So you don't have to you know, boil the cocoons of silkworms and kill all the silkworms and then have all this goopy, dirty water that often does not wind up in treatment plants. And, you know, the people doing this horrible work of unraveling all the silk from the cocoons and boiling water, not being paid pennies and treated badly. Instead, it's all done super high tech, creating cool new jobs in safe places, in safe, you know, environments that mm -hmm. have to meet safety standards. And um, and you grow as much as you need, so there's no waste. And that mm. is the future, my friends, zero waste. This is what we have to aim toward in everything we do. And then there's another great one in, in – um, so Bolt also is, are the folks who are creating leather out of mushroom root systems. It's a wow. little super high-tech sci-fi <laughs> to explain. I had a hard time explaining it in the book. Um, but it seems very cool, and those things are going to be on the in the marketplace pretty soon. They're get, they're scaling up to commercial viability really like around the corner in the next year. Yeah. You'll be able to buy spider silk outfits and mushroom hand leather handbags. And then there's another cool company in in New York and New Jersey called Modern Meadow that's it's kind of viewing the same idea where they're growing a leather like material. They can't call it leather because the leather industry says leather must come from an animal. But a leather-like material, if you put it under the microscope or you felt it with your hands, you go, oh, this is leather. It's not pleather. It's leather. Right. Grown from DNA. And they also grow to measure. Grow to measure, grow to shape. Grow as much as you need. No, and you're, this is a taking, impacting the, taking the, the pollution that's created by the animal farming, industrial farming that's so dirty. And, and all the waste. I mean, you know, a crocodile gets in a fight with another crocodile and has a big scar on his stomach. All that leather winds up in the bin because it's flawed. And you right. can grow, flaw, grow flawless leather in the lab. So this poor animal isn't sacrificing its life and half of its skin just to, you know, make a, one portion of a handbag. Um, it's, it's more sustainable and it's also, you know, more humane. Dana Thomas, her new book is called Fashionopolis, The Price of Fast Fashion and the Future of Clothes. Dana, thank you so much. My pleasure. Anytime. All right. Now we would like to hear from you, everyone. Do you practice sustainable fashion? Are you about to? Are you going to clean out your closet? I feel like I should post some photos of my shame and then we can all do this together. Uh, tell us how you're going to do it. Send us a voice memo or an email to make me smart at marketplace.org and we have gotten several emails from people asking, hey, you keep telling us to send a voice memo. How do I do that? So I want to say that uh, on your iPhone, there is a voice memo app already built in for Android. You can download it. I am told that Google just announced actually a really actually kind of awesome new voice memo audio, audio recording thing in the new Pixel. But if you don't have that, find an app in the App Store and download it. Uh, and then you open the app, find a quiet place, record. 30 to 45 seconds of yourself asking a question or give a comment, hit done, hit the share button and email the voice memo to make me smart at marketplace.org. All right, we'll be right back. All right, welcome back to the show. Uh, I cannot wait for you all to join me in the Instagram wall of shame with your fast fashion photos. I'm going to do it. I mean it. Uh, we are going to skip the news fix today because it's just not as fun without Kai. Uh, but since we are pushing back the explain-a-thon and skipping that, that means A, you have more time 
to send us your questions to our women listeners. We're talking to you. How come you're not emailing us? I know you're tweeting me all the time. Make me smart at marketplace.org. And uh, this also gives more time for your thoughts and comments, which we're going to get to right now. Hi, Kai and Molly. This is Brent in Detroit. This is Rebecca from Baltimore. It was great to hear comments on my question about GDPR. I wanted to put in my vote. I want to discuss a slightly different but maybe related thing. So our episode two weeks ago was all about nuclear, and we are still getting email. A lot of you had thoughts and comments. And one of the things that we kept hearing and we wanted to bring up was that you didn't think that we pushed hard enough on this issue of nuclear waste. Reed Branson was one of those listeners. Hi, Kai and Molly. This is Reed. I really appreciate your show on nuclear power. I thought it was fascinating, but I also thought that you asked the hard questions at the beginning about nuclear power and about nuclear waste and then let the guests skate more or less on answering those questions. Those are the central questions to whether or not this is a technology that can actually be brought online again or whether or not it's something that's uh, fated to die. So thanks for addressing that. That is, I think, a fair point. Now, according to our guest and other ex experts, part of the problem is that we do have the technology for the most part, to safely store nuclear waste. The controversy and amount of conversation about it is primarily political. So there are a lot of political problems with the discussion around nuclear waste. If you look at what happened in Yucca Mountain, which we talked about during that episode, it was basically a non-starter. So we hear you, nuclear waste is still an issue. It is not unsolvable. There's more work to do with figuring this one out. And to be clear, uh, there are also experts in this field who have said, listen, nuclear waste is an issue, but if you believe that climate change is an existential threat, we might just have to store it, uh, which is an interesting perspective as well. All right, this next uh, voice memo comes from John Thornton in Kansas. Hi, Kai and Molly. This is John Thornton from Cherryville, Kansas. Um, and I just wanted to make a comment on what Molly said about the boat rising in some places and not really rising in others. Um, in our area, we lost uh, an Amazon distribution facility in 2014, which took away about a thousand jobs. And then we lost Southwire a couple years later. And uh, you know, our economy is really actually hurting because um, we don't have those good manufacturing jobs around here. I just did a search on Zillow and within 30 minutes of where I live in Cherryville, uh, there are 350 homes for sale, which probably doesn't sound like a lot to most of you, but there are only 40,000 people probably living in the county. So there, there's a lot of people who just can't afford to buy a house because, you know, the best job I could find is working at McDonald's or the local Walmart, you know. And I can imagine in coal country, in a lot of places in this country, um, you know, it happened. John, I couldn't, I can't tell you how much I appreciate that perspective and how important that is. We're recording this now before tonight's Democratic debate. And I think, you know, what we were talking about that sparked this comment is the idea that these these are issues in America that haven't been solved. The, all of my family is in the middle of the country facing exactly these issues. They are looking for jobs that they can't find. They're saying we keep hearing that, you know, wages are going up, but minimum wage here is 750. So I I just I I could not appreciate more this perspective and thanks for sending your voice memo. It is now time for the make me smart question. What is something you thought you knew but you later found out you were wrong about? This one comes from celebrity chef Chris Kimball, just a little left turn guys. Now we're going to celebrity chef. He is the former host of America's Test Kitchen and the founder of Milk Street Kitchen. As I travel through the world talking to home cooks, what I didn't know was that everybody in every culture walks into the kitchen with a totally different point of view. Actually, they have a philosophy. In Japan, it's how you move in the kitchen. In Vietnam, it's sort of a Buddhist philosophy of the right way. There's a right way to do everything. In Bologna, in Italy, the grandmothers go into the kitchen and laugh and drink wine at 10 in the morning and have a good time. It's a continuation of their life. So cooking, it turns out, isn't just about preparing food. It's about living. And every culture has a different way of doing that. About a year ago, I visited Dakar in Senegal, 
uh, and I was cooking with Pierre Chum. He's a now a New York chef from Dakar. And as he was cooking, he tasted the food by putting a little bit on the back of his hand uh, and then licking it off. Uh, and he said, that's how we taste here in Senegal. And I tried it, and it turns out it's a much better way of tasting food. The food on your skin manages to give you the full flavor of the food as opposed to on a spoon or a fork. So what I didn't know was to taste food, taste it off your hand, not off a spoon. I mean, I'm just saying, guys, you learn stuff on this show that you never thought you were going to learn. Also, it is roughly 1044 a.m. here in Oakland, and I think it is time for me to go and drink some wine and start cooking. Thank you for listening. If you'd like what, don't tell my bosses I just said that. If you'd like what we do uh, and you would like to learn more amazing things like taste food off your hand, not off a spoon, please subscribe to our newsletter. Marketplace.org slash newsletters is packed with interesting information every week. Make Me Smart was produced and directed this week by Sam Anderson. Our digital producer is Tony Wagner. Our senior producer is Jody Becker. And we had additional support from Bridget Bodner. Our video this week was produced by Summer Dunsmore. Our engineer was Daniel Ramirez. The theme music you're hearing right now, I know you're chair dancing because I am, was composed by Ben Tolliday and Daniel Ramirez. The executive director of On Demand is Sitar Nieves. And the senior vice president and general manager is Deborah Clark. That was kind of a lie. It's not the dancing part of the music yet, so I'm not actually dancing just yet. But I will be. And I have to tell you and be honest about it because now there's video and you'll know. <laughs>